I love Phillip Island. It's home to so many seabirds and such an important place for seabirds that I have a real respect for it and admiration for it. It's somewhere that needs to be protected and yeah, I love coming here. I always have since the first time I came here. It was so stark and just viewing it from the main island, it, it was already looked like somewhere special to visit. This is one of the best islands in Australia, and it's got, I think, 13 or 14 species of seabirds on it. And that's incredibly rich. What if you turn on and just an appliance? Yeah, I have got appliances on. Like the internet. It's not running.
Phillip Island is made from volcanic tuff. So it's, uh, it's the stuff that's ejected from volcanoes. And so it's a really, uh, not quite friable soil, but it's granular. But because it's a 280 metre high island, steep sides, having lost so much of its vegetation to ferals, it's eroding like all bilios. And because of that, you get veg on the ridge lines, veg in the gullies, and on the slopes, it's bare, or mostly bare. It's an island that's been absolutely trashed by humans. Not humans themselves, but all the rubbish that they bring with them. You know, we're talking rabbits, goats and pigs, and then all the weeds that have come in afterwards. And most of the damage here has actually been the long-term presence of rabbits since, I don't know, the 1850s through to 1988. So it's, it's been trashed by them constantly chewing anything that was coming up so that they would survive. And they got wiped out by the locals. The locals shot them out, which was brilliant. And they've attempted to try and have native vegetation recover. But really the vegetation here is mostly driven by African olive, which is a, a bugger of a plant, which produces huge amounts of fruits that both germinate underneath the plant and then are picked up by all the frugivorous birds, the fruit eating birds transported elsewhere. So it's everywhere on the island. Another big fluffy chick here. Is there? In uh, whatever this one is, uh, 71. But there's a tropic bird right here. Yeah, you can't put your here. foot on it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's it for along here. We've never had any other joy along here. So it's up high. You come in here, you have to stand here and look down there. So put your feet near the tropic bird. And then. He doesn't like that. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Good size, bigger, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a tiny little Kermit egg petrel. This one's probably uh, a couple of weeks old. Wait for mum and dad. Have no idea what the plumage is. You won't. We won't know for three months. Pretty well. 98 days for fledging. White morph. See the colour of that one as it came over? Here he comes again. Round. Swing him back. In. Here he comes. Here he comes. He's going to come over the top. No, he's a dark morph and a light morph. Here's a light morph. Just here. Right on the wind. Whoa. Hello. Oh, nice. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> Look at this oh, dark here's a one. dark one. Here's a dark one right here too, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. These conditions are perfect. What's that? There's Kermit's calling down there. Woo! 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 Wuckle, 
Not many people have ever got to experience what we're experiencing with these thousands of you know, rare birds flying around just, just yeah, all streaming in, coming to feed their chicks or lay their eggs. And it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling. And that's why all of the uh, so-called adversity to get here is, is worth it because, you know, I think just being able to experience those things, and I do appreciate that. The rarest birds we've got here, probably white-necked petrel, which is a, uh, a really robust pterodroma gadfly petrel. The next rarest bird probably is Providence petrel. Its main breeding site is around the mountains of Lord Howe. Here there's about 200 breeding pairs, so quite rare. But the bird that draws me here is Kermadec petrel. It occurs on about half a dozen, eight islands across the Pacific between Chile and here. Here on Phillip, they nest under bushes. So as long as you can get on the island, you can study the birds. And that's what I've been doing every couple of months for the last five years. Kermadec petrel, it was, it was considered that they are summer and winter breeders. But Kermadec petrels are here year round. What petrels normally do is they breed when the resources are the best. So what have they discovered that no other petrel species has been able to take advantage of? Well, Kermadec petrels are uh, David's efficient species in New South Wales, so very little is known about them. So our first goal is to just understand as much as we can about them to aid in their conservation. But long term, it's to uh, make them secure uh, so that they're no longer a, a threatened species and that their long term future is, is safe. What we have here on Phillip is the most accessible Kermadec petrel population in the world. So. For me, it is one of the biggest privileges as a scientist and as an ecologist to be able to study this bird. 27 slash 01 slash 22. Yeah, GMT. So these are my box of cherries, mate. These are my... my uh... They did a study here on wedgetail shielders, one of the other seabirds here, and over... 23 years, they banded uh, 44,000 wedgetail shearwaters. Of the 44,000, they had 28 bands that were found on dead birds somewhere else in the world and reported back to them. Okay? One of these loggers can record more data in one year than they did in 23 years in terms of where the bird has been. Loggers will last for several years, they have enough battery life, so we just attach them to the legs. But they need to be retrieved, we can't get any data from them unless we retrieve the loggers. No one knows where Kermadec petrels go when they leave this island, and so we can then track them. We can find out where they go when they're provisioning their chicks, where they go during the off-season, when they're replenishing after breeding, and, and that's really important because we need to understand what oceanic resources these birds are relying on so that they can be protected. So you got anything there? No, nothing in this one. So I just had a single unbanded bird and yeah. that's it. There's a camera set down. It popped out. Flew. Sorry? He popped out and flew. flew. Yeah. yeah. Now there was one more. There is a nest here, but can't see anything doing nothing there. In it. Yeah. There was one deep in here. We've got a logger bird here. So we're going to uh, collect some data and uh, take the logger off it. 
This is one of our first birds too, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, one of yeah. our first birds, yep. No more data from you. No more data, well, no more logger data. This is a tracking logger that's been on this bird several years. We're going to take it off and read the data. So it's from uh, nest 16, but it's also been in 153, just up here. So this is the band 08316337. And I think we banded this bird at the, at the, in January uh, 2017. Beautiful birds. I'll just pop him back here. There you go, buddy. Walking up around this island at night, when, when there's probably almost 20,000 blackwing petrels here. So at this time of year, they're all on the ground from late afternoon, and you, you've got to almost step over them all the way up to the path. And it, it's it's incredible, really, to, to 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 see birds like that up close. And you know, and, and it's you know hard work. It's the wind's howling, and and it can it can be hot too, hot and sweaty work. But you know, just to be surrounded by those birds all the time, it's. Uh, yeah, again, a, a privilege to, to be a part of. Two birds, one egg on the 16th of June. So it lasted less than eight hours. Bastards. Um, so there's the chick. Could be underneath the bird. Don't know who that is. That's at 4 p.m. 5 p.m. Go on, babe, I'd look for it. Yeah, 6 p.m. it's gone. Yeah, mm -hmm. 8pm definitely gone. Yeah. Yeah, the bastard's got it. Well, most likely tailor bird, purple swamp hen. And it's one of our winter breeders and we really want to get more winter breeder information and the fact that that nest has bred successfully before but if they've had a failure early on, it may mean that they'll split up and we won't get our loggers back. Petrels are very important for island ecology. They bring nutrients from the marine environment onto the island. So they gather food at sea, they come to islands, they defecate, some of their chicks die and then decompose into the soil. And so there's a, it's been going on for thousands of years. The, the amount of energy that's produced in the oceans, which is then brought onto land. And without that, you wouldn't have all of this vegetation and soil invertebrates and everything that relies on those, that transfer of, of nutrients from one place to another.
here on Phillip Island, we have a centipede which feeds on nestlings, seabird nestlings. It'll go into a seabird burrow when the chick is left by itself and it will envenomate the chick and then eat it. And that's really unusual to have an invertebrate killing a vertebrate. So much so that the centipede is actually critical for the recovery of this island because in killing those nestlings, all their body mass, which is marine derived nutrients that have turned into a seabird, go into the soil and it increases the fertility here. reason I'm working on Kermadec petrels and loving it so much, I've got 56 breeding pairs. I know every one of them is. Here, we're understanding the complexity of what we've got because we know where all the birds are. We know most of the individuals because we've been banning them for five years. And we can try to pull apart what used to be seen as a really simple thing. Oh, seabirds mate for life. Nah. I wish they did. Life would be easy. They don't. And that's I really love that in science. When, when you look deeper, you find there are a lot more questions, but it's endlessly fascinating because you've really got to use your science brain to try and work out what's going on. It's like being an artist. It's like a painter or a, you know, an actor. or It's about creating something out of nothing. Oh, the spectacle is just phenomenal. It's one of nature's great things because most pterodromas, most petrels only come to land at night. And so you, you hear this, like on Cabbage Tree Island with a thousand pairs of Gould's petrel, you hear this, you don't see it. It's just bloody... Pretty special to see this. That's great. Yeah. Wouldn't be anywhere else, mate. No, it's true. I love it, it's in my blood. It's a passion for discovery. I love hunting petrels. I'm a petrel hunter. I love doing it. I can't think of anything more enjoyable in my life than hunting petrels. Trying to understand and see the country as they see it and going, they might be down here and finding something that's really rare. And then we use our knowledge of how they interact with the island to hunt for more. Petrel hunting is my favourite sport by a long shot. It's a magnificent place, magnificent animals, spend all their time at sea, and for me, the gold is here on their nesting sites. Being here so often, um, and for such a length of time, you know, you get to know the birds that are, that are here, and you, you know their calls, and it's, it's really nice to have gotten to know this place over the years, and to, yeah, to really feel some sense of responsibility for it. I think. My hope would be that we make some contribution to the conservation of seabirds uh, and along the way uh, satisfy some of the curiosity that I have biologically. <laughs>